Hi, I'm Jim Griffin, Investment Content Manager for EMEA at Columbia Threadneedle Investments. In this special episode from the Eye of the Needle podcast team, we're talking about Black History Month, what it is and what it means, not only to our guests at their respective asset management groups, but also to the asset management industry as a whole. So, lots to talk about. And joining me to do so are Ibele Wangwu, Investments Analyst at Columbia Threadneedle, and Dennis Wusu sem who is an Oversight Relationship Manager at BMO Asset Management. Welcome to both of you. Hi, thank you, Jim. Hi, thank you for having me. Now, Abele, before we really get into today's topic, can you tell us a little bit about what your role as an investment analyst entails and how you got into asset management in the first place? Of course. So I work on the central research team. We look at lots of different sectors and we carry out specific research for the investment teams and then we'll feed those ideas into them. I originally got into the asset management industry through the I-2020 programme, which is a graduate scheme that was set up to bring in more diverse interns into the industry. My background, so I studied economics, um, and while I was studying, I interned in investment banking at Goldman Sachs. Then I graduated and worked in wealth advisory, so I lived in Abu Dhabi for a year. Um, And it was while I was doing that job that I was sent this I-2020 programme um, and the organisation actually that sent it out was SEO. So SEO is the Sponsors for Educational Opportunity and again they focus on you know giving opportunities and training to young people that come from either different ethnic backgrounds or different socio-economic backgrounds as well. So yeah I joined the firm in 2017 and did two different rotations around the business and I've been here ever since. Yeah, very good. Excellent. And uh, moving on to you, Dennis, what are your particular areas of focus as an oversight relationship manager and what was your path into asset management? Sure. Um, so by way of background, I'm an economics graduate um, from the University of Bath, spent some time at Goldman Sachs and then started working in asset management. Um, the first role I had was in quality assurance, then spent some time in client services. And now as an oversight relationship manager, we basically manage the relationship between um, BMO and State Street, where we outsourced our investment operations team. Um, alongside that, I've done a few things to kind of keep me engaged as well. Um, first of which was creating an educational app, which did a million downloads in its first year, then started up a networking organization. And then a work colleague asked me, how many black role models in the UK do you know who are not in music, sports or entertainment? I could only think up of three at the time. So went out, interviewed as many senior black leaders as I could find and released the content. That then evolved into events, which then evolved into conferences. And we get senior executives from across the world to talk to black and ethnic minority professionals about what we need to get ahead. Um, so, yeah, that's myself in a very brief nutshell and i actually met dennis before work yes through, yes partly that's... through one of his success talks yeah this is when i was like true. 15. Oh, yeah. very good oh, yeah. so your, your paths have crossed before indeed okay so as i said earlier we're discussing black history month in this episode um now by way of introduction black history month is celebrated throughout october in the uk um, and is clearly one of the most prominent cultural celebrations of the year honouring contributions made to society by people of black heritage and their communities. Um, You can read all about it at blackhistorymonth.org.uk. Ibele, I'll start with you. What are your thoughts on Black History Month and what does it mean to you as a celebration? I think it's one of those things that you almost don't want to have to celebrate. Um, It would be great for, you know, everyone to just know about black history and for it to have been incorporated in, for example, the curriculum. But a big issue, I suppose, is that we don't necessarily know the contributions that these people have made um, and how entwined that black history is with just standard British history. So, yeah, for me, it's just making sure that information that should already be known is more widely known and just kind of highlighting more of the underrepresentation, not only in our industry, but across lots of different industries as well. And, and Dennis, what about you? What are your thoughts on the importance of having a Black History Month? No, I, I echo everything that Abele has um, actually mentioned, because 
I think there's been many contributions of black individuals to the UK over the years that isn't necessarily well known about or celebrated. And so Black History Month gives us that opportunity to, to highlight those successes and contributions to UK society. Um, it would be great if this was actually embedded into like the general curriculum, but we just obviously have to start from here and continue to push forward. I think in recent years, with the Windrush scandal and the Black Lives Matter movement, um, there's been a lot more focus on the racial disparities, not in just in the UK, but across the world. Um, and I think this month, especially last in the last 18 months or so, um, it's allowed black people to really become a bit more vulnerable and sharing their experiences and allowing people to actually understand a bit more about what life is like for a black person in the UK. Yeah. And um, sticking with you, Dennis, how diverse, I mean, moving on to kind of what we do in our jobs, how diverse would you say the asset management industry is and how has that made uh, strides in recent years? Oh, I, I think it's quite well known that the industry isn't as diverse as it could be. I think the Investment Association um, launched a, a report uh, a couple of years ago um, in relation to the experiences of black people within the UK. And there are a number of findings from that report showing that obviously companies are trying to bring diversity to the forefront. Um, there's lots of initiatives going on. I think about 42% of the companies they surveyed actually had like initiatives or, and like I think it was about 90% wanted to do um, these initiatives or had plans of doing these initiatives. And at the time, I think there was only about 12 or 13 um, fund managers in the city. I believe that's improved now, but it's no way representative of the population in the main. Um, so that's where it has been in recent times. I think over the last couple of years, there's been a number of initiatives. I think about a, it's a member of Investment 2020, and that's about increasing the diversity of candidates into the city and asset management as a whole. I think their last cohort had about 49% of ethnically diverse um, candidates. And then there's other initiatives out there like SEO, um, Talk About Black, Amos Bursary, Urban Synergy, uh, Race at Work Charter. And there's all of these initiatives are coming together to help improve the diversity. Um, and it's not quite there yet, but hopefully with continued pushing, um, it will get there eventually. Yeah, so I'm on the right path at least, but lots more that has to be done. Um, Abella, given what Dennis has said, can we apply what Black History Month celebrates and teaches to our industry? And if so, how? Yeah, I'd say definitely. Um, so Dennis mentioned the Accelerating Black Inclusion Report, um, and there were lots of findings within it. It was headed up by Yasmin Chinwala. And I think one of the really important things was the idea that we've kind of focused a lot on entry level in terms of black inclusion, but also we need to think more about more senior leaders and how we can ensure that they have the right training and access to those positions as well. Um, and it's interesting with investments, our job is literally to interrogate the business models of different companies and have that diverse mindset towards that. So it's like the more diverse backgrounds that you can include, whether that's gender, whether that's race, the better the outcome essentially is for our clients because we're being more rigorous about how we ex uh, how, how we assess those investments. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like it makes complete sense, doesn't it, really? Mm -hmm. um, so, Dennis, what developments, achievements or contributions in our industry around black inclusion have really stood out to you in recent years? Um, I think in recent years, the Diversity Project has probably been the, the standout initiative because initially it looked at all of the different strands of diversity within the industry and if you look at it from an ethnic perspective there's the talk about black strand uh, and why i think the diversity project is important is because at the end of the day it's going to take lots of different people to actually come together to make the difference to actually embrace the different elements of diversity um, and i think in recent times um, there have been more organizations that are coming to the fore to actually add value so i think um, the FCA recently with the Bank of England and the PRA came out with some recommendations as to what it's going to take to, to change the dial and actually improve diversity in the main. And so I would say the diversity project and now um, bigger entities are now coming to support this. So hopefully in a few years um, we will be able to see um, the change which we all desire. Now you mentioned the talk about black project there that was founded as a work stream of the diversity project to accelerate inclusion in the investment and savings industry. 
Can you tell us more about this program, um, what its ultimate aim is and what it's achieved? Yeah, so I think in terms of the ultimate aim, it's to increase the numbers of black leaders, or at least in the pipeline, by 2025. It was started by Dawid Konate Ohulu, and he obviously is quite prominent. He works at Reddington, chairman of that, founded that, and he's quite prominent in the industry. And he wanted to kind of ask the question as to what exactly is it? Why are there not as many black individuals in the seat, at the table, um, so to speak, where he's having meetings and discussions and things? And so together with Justin Onakusi, Gavin Lewis, um, Angie Kang-Stewart, Rachel Green, um, and Darren Johnson, they've really taken the lead to, to push the dial in terms of seeing ways by which we can increase black representation in the asset management industry. And they do that at all stages. So they have skills workshops, which help people in university to develop more of a broad awareness, but then also the skills needed to enter the industry. Um, they have mentoring circles, which are really focused on individuals with one to 10 years of experience to help them deal with the challenges that they face, whether it be learning to negotiate, dealing with difficult people, everything that you need to really help accelerate your career, so to speak, but also actually stay in the industry. Because what you tend to find is that after a few years, you tend to see a lot of black individuals leave because they're experiencing challenges within the industry. Um, and another initiative which they're looking to do is looking at the other end of the spectrum. And so they have a mentoring program with black senior leaders and tying them up with other senior leaders across the asset management industry. So Talk About Black is looking at the entire pipeline and looking to affect the change. Yeah, it sounds really positive. A great initiative. Um, Abele, uh, Columbia Threadneedle has played a role in uh, what was the 100 Black Interns Programme, now the 10,000 Black Interns Programme. Um, can you tell us more about that and the firm's involvement? Yeah, definitely. So with the 100 Black Interns Programme, that's how it initially started, um, with a focus on just having 100 Black Interns that we would place into different internships across the industry. Um, and Columbia Threadneedle joined in those initial stages. Um, and then the project kind of blew up. It got so popular, so big that it was rolled out to 10,000 internships. And if I'm correct, it wasn't just asset management. It was across lots of different industries. Um, so at the time, for me, this is something that was really exciting. Obviously, I was already in a full time job, so I couldn't apply, but I shared it with my networks. Um, and we've actually taken on two interns this year. So they've been rotating around. So they were in fixed income and equity, and then they rotated and swapped. And then now what's actually happened is we've taken them on full time for our two year graduate program, which is a new scheme. So it's just exciting that, you know, this opportunity is available that wasn't necessarily there before. And it's just adding to the diversity of our workforce. Yeah, and to see it grow like that is uh, yeah. really fabulous. Mm -hmm. um, Dennis, there has been some wider discussion about the ethnicity pay gap in the UK, um, with everyone from the Commission on Race and Ethnic Disparities to talk about black sharing their views on this. Can you tell us a bit about that discussion and the main challenges and benefits of this reporting? Yeah, um, it's um, a bit of a politically charged one um, in certain okay. aspects. Um, but yeah, from my when it, when you look at the commission, um, some of their recommendations have basically said um, that in certain areas of the country, I think in 437 out of the 650 constituencies, um, the population is 90% white. And so therefore, if you were to do an ethnicity pay gap um, reporting exercise, it wouldn't necessarily be representative or accurate because of the basic localities of ethnic minorities. Um, and while I conceive the logic behind that, I don't think like the wider impact is actually being taken into consideration in my personal opinion, because I think one of the most important things about these reporting exercises is that it allows a conversation to start happening and it allows like change to actually start happening. Even if you look at the gender pay gap, for example, um, you can look at the stats and more women actually do part time work than actually full time work. So that leads to some of the discrepancies, but it's not supposed to be an all encompassing tool. And that's the same for the ethnicity pay gap as well. It's supposed to be something which is used to spark the conversation and to focus on the areas where you do have that data to see what the challenges are, why things are happening and what you can do to address the change. Because once you reduce that gap, then that's obviously going to filter into other areas of society as well and lead to the balance that we want. So, yeah, two 
contrasting perspectives on this, but I think overall, if we're trying to get that equality, then ethnicity pay gap is something that is quite important. And there are some firms that have actually taken this and without it being mandatory from the government. But I think with a bit of government support to get there, it will be important. And I think on the 25th of October, it's being discussed in the House of Lords. So it'll be interesting to see what comes from those discussions. Absolutely. Um, Abele, turning to you as a, a younger person working in asset management, I wonder if you could give us your perspective on how young people entering the industry might feel about the challenges and opportunities open to them. But I don't want to oversimplify it, but even as children, you kind of look up to people that look like you and you think if they can do something, I can do that as well. And so when you're in the workplace, for example, and you come in and you don't see people that look like you reflected in senior leadership or on the executive boards, it can be quite disheartening sometimes. And so I think for young people that come into the industry newly, having initiatives like that just kind of gives them a bit more hope and aspiration that actually I can reach X position because um, you know, there's initiatives in place to help me and because there are increasingly more people that look like me that are doing those roles. Um, so, for example, when I joined, I was the only black woman in investments and it was one of those things where you don't think about it day to day, but it's just something where you're like, oh, OK, why are there no black female fund managers and is that something that I can do? And I think something that's really important is that mentoring, but also as well as mentoring, it's sponsorship. Um, and I think people sometimes mix the two. Mentoring is good because you have somebody that you can ask questions and find out more about the industry from, but sponsorship is more active. It's a senior person that kind of takes you under their wing and says, these are the opportunities that are available. What do you want me to help you get into? And I was very lucky that when I joined CTI, I had sponsorship as well as mentorship. Um, and it's something that I think is really important for lots of millennials and young people that enter the industry. Yeah, so it's, I mean, it's still some way to go, which is something, you know, a kind of recurring theme as we uh, have these discussions. Um, I mean, what can we do as an industry to change that? And also broadening that question out to appeal to younger generations in general about the importance of finance, you know, savings and investment. I think there's probably two parts. The first part is kind of getting them when they're young so in schools in colleges just explaining what asset management is because I for example I didn't know what it was until I was at university um, I come from a Nigerian background so my career choices were you become a doctor an engineer or a lawyer they didn't really know <laughs> about anything else and um, so I think it's important to go to schools and we've done lots of things where we go and give talks at schools as well um, and it's really helpful because it just gives them insight into a career that they never knew about and then the other point, I think, is on just savings and investments in general, just teaching young people how important it is to have a pension, to maybe have a stocks and shares ISA, how to manage your money. So that financial literacy side of things. Um, and obviously, I think at the moment, it's not something that's a core part of the school curriculum, um, but it's something that's really, really important. Um, and at the moment, I write a blog to encourage young people to start learning about investing and all that sort of stuff. Um, and I think just the more that we can build that education at the younger level, the better it can get going forward. Yeah, I mean, personal finance has long been mooted as something for the national curriculum and never quite happened, but I think it would be invaluable. Um, well, I mean, that's it for this uh, very special episode, a fascinating discussion and clearly so much more still to do as an industry, but there are clearly some great initiatives uh, in place that will hopefully bear fruit, that need to bear fruit in years to come. Um, once again, my thanks to Dennis and Abele for taking the time to speak to me. It's been really great. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Us. Thank you for having us. And uh, just to remind you, you can read more about, about Black History Month at blackhistorymonth.org.uk. Uh, thanks for listening, and we'll be back soon with another episode of Eye of the Needle. Bye-bye. Important information. Your capital is at risk. Past performance is not a guide to future performance. The analysis included in this podcast has been produced by Columbia Threadneedle Investments for its own investment management activities. 
Information obtained from external sources is believed to be reliable, but its accuracy or completeness cannot be guaranteed. None of Columbia Threadneedle Investments, its directors, officers or employees make any representation, warranty, guarantee or other assurance that any of these forward-looking statements will prove to be accurate. The mention of any specific shares or bonds should not be taken as a recommendation to deal. This podcast is not investment, legal, tax or accounting advice. Investors should consult with their own professional advisors for any advice. Issued by Threadneedle Asset Management Limited, registered in England and Wales, number 573204. Cannon Place, 78 Cannon Street, London, EC4N 6AG. Authorised and regulated in the UK by the Financial Conduct Authority. Columbia Threadneedle Investments is the global brand name of the Columbia and Threadneedle Group of Companies.